<clears throat> Matthew chapter 9, we see uh, a lot of healings and, and things like that. In 8 and 9, you see these demons driven out. But in 9, we have a little break for a couple of questions. We saw one of those questions last week, another question this week, and they both are, uh, revolve around or involve uh, food and eating. might be weird for us as Baptists, particularly because for Baptists, and if you ever thought about this, I don't know why this is, but it's true for Baptists, the words food and fellowship are synonymous, right? I mean, it's like, we're going to have a fellowship. What are we eating, right? Like, that's what's going to happen. And as a matter of fact, we have a fellowship coming up in September, our big fish fry last Sunday of September. Put that on your calendar. But we're going to have a fellowship. We're going to eat some delicious fried fish. And you you might have heard the old joke, I love it, but about the kindergarten class that was asked to bring, there you go, hey, hey my people back there are on the ball, look at that. Uh, my uh, kindergarten class was asked to bring a show and tell item, and particularly one that represented their religion. So, you know, the girl who was Catholic, she brought a rosary, and she talked about the rosary. I'm Catholic, and this is my rosary. And the little boy who was Jewish brought a Star of David, and he explained that I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, and here's my Star of David, and the little boy named Tommy said, I'm Tommy, I'm Baptist, and this is my casserole dish. You know, and that's just kind of how it is. You know, every good Baptist home has a 9 by 13 Pyrex dish with their name on it, you know, to make sure you get it back. And so food for us is, uh, is, is, is something we, we tend to enjoy and, and celebrate. Some of us enjoy and celebrate a little too much, but that's all right. But in Matthew chapter 9, we have the second question about food. And I'll remind you, in chapter 9, the first question is when, when Jesus called Matthew, the tax collector. He calls him to salvation, but not only to salvation, but to be a, a disciple, an apostle, to come work for Jesus, you know? And after doing that, Jesus, uh, Matthew, excuse me, holds a little celebration. We see it in chapter 10. It's a little bit clearer in some of the other gospel accounts, but he essentially holds a, a little festival, a feast at his house, and he invites these other tax collectors and sinners that, that weren't um, allowed to be around the Pharisees and the other folks, they come and it seems like he's honoring Jesus, but also spreading the word like, he saved me, look what he can do for you. It's an incredible moment. And it's on that occasion that the Pharisees question him about eating with sinners. Jesus tells him, look, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. I'm here for the sinners. It's not the well who need a doctor, it's the sick who need a doctor. And then they go from questioning him about eating with sinners to this question we'll look at this morning, and it's why do you eat at all? Why are you eating? Look at verse 14. It says, Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the skins burst and the wine spills out and the skins are ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserves. preserved. So the first question came from the Pharisees to the disciples about Jesus. This one comes from John's disciples to Jesus about his disciples. And the first question you might ask is, and this is what strikes me about this passage, why do these people who ask the question even exist? Why are John's disciples still a thing? These are John the Baptist's disciples. Remember, John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. To get people ready. He preached repentance. The Messiah is coming. We've got to be ready for him when he gets here. And as a matter of fact, John the Baptist has been in prison since chapter 4. John the Baptist said of Jesus to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He told Jesus in front of his disciples, I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. Why are people still following John and not Jesus? John effectively turns his disciples over to Jesus. Like, listen, I was coming to prepare the way for him. Implied in that is go follow him, right? 
And I don't know the answer to that question, but it's something we see all the way up into the book of Acts in chapters 13 and 14. Paul encounters in Ephesus some of John's disciples. And history records, even up into the second century, another hundred years later, people were still following John the Baptist. A cult of John the Baptist had, uh, was present there. And so they just kind of missed the whole point of John the Baptist. And it seems to me like maybe they're just following the, the preacher instead of following Jesus, who he was preaching about. That happens today sometimes, doesn't it? We follow the preacher. We're, we're bad about often following people instead of following Jesus, but the point of the people is to point us to Jesus. So when the preacher leaves, maybe we do too. And if that's the case, then who are you following? The people, the person, the preacher? Or are you following Jesus? So my first question is why these people even exist, but they are here to ask Jesus this question and he's, this question is like, we fast, and so do the Pharisees. It's never good when you're lumped in with the Pharisees, okay? That's never a good thing, but here's the case. Uh, we fast often, but your disciples don't fast. I want to point out this. Uh, continued scrutiny. You'll see this throughout the Bible, throughout the Gospels. Jesus is scrutinized over and over and over and over again, right? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why are your disciples doing this? And why are they doing that? Over and over and over. And literally, they criticized Jesus up until the point where they killed Jesus, okay? He was criticized until he was crucified. That's his life. And he even says in the Gospel of John, he says, you know, if they hated me, guess what? If the world hates you, guess what? They hated me. If they hated me, they're going to hate you too. I think it's important to note, as you see this over and over and over, that if Jesus was criticized and we follow Jesus, then what should we expect? Same thing. If this is how they treated the Messiah and we're trying to model our lives after him, we should expect the same thing. It's over and over and over. So the question then is about fasting. And if you're not uh, familiar with church or the Bible very much, so glad you are here. Let me just kind of explain to you what fasting is. Fasting is supposed to be the, you know, voluntarily abstaining from food for the purpose of focusing and worshiping God. That's what fasting is supposed to be. You don't eat food. You still drink water, but you don't eat food so that you can focus on God. And in the Old Testament, fasting is commanded. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about it. Think about Old Testament. And some of you might know the answer, so, you know, just keep it to yourself. But in the Old Testament, how many times do you think, off the top of your head, if you don't know, how many times do you think it's required of the Israelites to fast per year? How many times do you think? Just think about it. I mean, you know about the Old Testament. Think about it. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Once. Did you think it'd be more than that? No, most people are like, uh-uh. Okay, just me. I was fine. One time a year. One time a year the Israelites were supposed to fast on the Day of Atonement. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16 spells it out. They're supposed to fast, abstain from food one time a year. The Pharisees fasted two times a week. If once a year is good, 104 times a year, even better, right? That's kind of their mentality. Twice a week. And, and the John's disciples are lumped in there. We fast a lot, but your, your disciples don't fast at all. You can almost hear the judgment in there, can't you? They're supposed to do it once a uh, It's required once a year. They do it twice a week. In the New Testament, fasting is never commanded. It's never prescribed to us. I'd say it's recommended uh, in the New Testament, but it's never prescribed. The, the, uh, in, matter of fact, we've already seen in Matthew chapter 6, the Pharisees, when they fasted twice a week, they would disfigure their face and look gloomy in the marketplace. That way everybody knew they were fasting. Oh, look how spiritual they are. They, must be, they look sick. They must be fasting. Oh, it's Thursday. They must be fasting again. So Jesus even has already in the Sermon on the Mount criticized their form of fasting. But in the New Testament, we do see fasting, Acts chapter 13 and chapter 14. There's important decisions to be made by the early church. So what do they do? They take time and pray and fast. Important decisions. We need God's help here. We need him to speak to us and to instruct us, to lead us and guide us so we will focus some time specifically in prayer. And, and that's what fasting is supposed to be. 
It's not a Christian diet plan, all right? It's not two birds, one stone. Hey, trying to get ready for swimsuit season, and I want to beef up my spiritual life at the same time. Boom, fasting. No, that's not how it's supposed to work. The point of fasting is to remind yourself that you don't need earthly things. All you need is God. All you need is Jesus in your life. It's to take some time and refrain from food and spend that time where you would normally eat in prayer. Or every time that stomach of yours turns over in hunger, you say, oh, good reminder, I need to pray again. You got something coming up, big major life decision. I encourage you to take a day and fast and pray about it. I think it's a good thing. I don't think it's required. I think it's a good idea. I think we see it in the, in the New Testament, good practice. Let me ask you, is there a person in your life that you're concerned about their salvation? They're not saved, and you're worried about it. You're thinking about it. Maybe I could recommend to you, what if you took a day and fasted from food and spent that time in prayer, praying specifically for that individual to come to faith in Jesus? Is that a good idea? I think it is. But it's not required. And for these uh, disciples of John, they were criticizing the disciples of Jesus as if it was required. As if their human regulation, their human rule, was actually one of God's rules. And if they followed that rule, they would be as good as or justified like them. It's a term for that we have Uh, In our day and age today, we call that legalism. Legalism is justifying yourself before God by observing laws. And it's particularly bad when it's even laws that you've created. These are manufactured by humans, human laws, human rules. They're not even in the Bible. And so um, I remember growing up in in youth group and um, for a few years before I got saved, And and I remember at that time in my life, the message that I was getting from church was, don't drink beer, don't have sex, and don't listen to secular music. Like, that was my take home, you know? That's what I got. Now, now listen, um, you know, we want to call people to holiness, to live by God's standard, absolutely. What we don't want to do is manufacture rules and then press those man-made rules on people. And when they, they don't live up to those standards, we say, well, you're not right with God. And so I, I won't, I'll leave, uh, you know, the big hot topic there alone, and I'll just mention this one, uh, secular music. So secular music, that was a big thing in our youth group. And you're like, what is secular music? Well, secular music, I guess, is non-Christian music, okay? That was a thing. If you listen to, to non-Christian music, man... That was really bad, they say. So I was, and I know it's, it's hard for you to imagine, a little bit of a sarcastic and um, smart aleck young man. And so I would ask questions like this. Okay, secular music's bad. What about Beethoven, Mozart? Secular. That wasn't Christian music. Is that okay to listen to? Like, I didn't listen to that at 14, 15 years old, you know. What about that, you know? And they, you know, I, at some time they'd say, well, you know, I guess. You know, we'll give you that one. That was the idea, right? So there's, there's a principle there. There's some, some kind of music that, as Christians, probably not beneficial for our spiritual life to be listening to. And somebody in our youth group developed that personal conviction, right? Like, hey, this kind of music I've been listening to, it's not really good for my spiritual life. I'm probably going to avoid that. And they took that personal conviction, expanded upon it, and then blanketed it to everybody in the youth group. Now, in all fairness, I was probably listening to music I shouldn't have been listening to, okay? I probably was. And that's probably why I was reacting so strongly to it. But they took it even a step further. There was a group of of kids in our youth group, older kids, a little older than me, that put a list together. I kid you not of things that they weren't going to do and words they weren't going to say. And, and we know the words you're not supposed to say, right? I mean, like, we don't have to, like, like everybody in here is clear on that, I think, right? I don't need a slide or anything, do I? We got it. Okay. 
But this didn't just include those words. This included like Christian cuss words, like crud. You know what I mean? It's like, we can't say crud. You know, and it was like, well, the reasoning was, well, we know what you're really trying to say. And I remember thinking, and I was pretty young, and I remember thinking, oh, that sounds familiar, <laughs> doesn't it? I feel like somebody else did this, made a bunch of extra rules and then blanketly applied those to other people, right? It was the Pharisees, okay? It's these guys that we're talking about. And so we, we could be guilty of this. And, and a lot of times what it is is we develop personal convictions based on our walk with the Lord, our study of God's word. There's some things in our life we go, you know what? I don't think I should do that. I think it's bad for me to do that. The Bible doesn't specifically say don't do that, but for me, that's not gonna be a good thing in my life. It's not gonna help my walk with the Lord, so I'm gonna avoid it. And that's awesome. That's great. Problem is, when you take that and apply that as God's standard to other people's life, or you take that standard, that thing you're avoiding, secular music or whatever it might be, and say, well, okay, this week, okay, Sunday morning again, I'm here at church. Okay, this week, did I listen to any uh, Tupac? Okay, no, right? I don't, I don't know who they listen to today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Young Jeezy, is that one of them? <laughs> no, I got nothing. I got, I'm sorry, I've heard that one. Um, nobody wants to answer because then they'd be, they'd be guilty, right? <laughs> like, yeah, that's what we, I mean, that's what they... Um, Right? So, so you take that, you go, okay, I haven't listened to any of these people. I haven't done this thing, or I did this thing. Okay, I'm good. Me and God are good. I had a good week. Me and God are straight. We're good. But that's not even the Bible. That's not how we should be judging our lives. That's not how we should be evaluating the holiness and obedience to Christ in our lives by artificial standards, man-made rules, fasting twice a week. You know, these guys, we get to, get to synagogue on Sunday and go, oh, on Thursday, I had a burrito. Man, I blew it, you know? And it's like, that's not even there. Like, where do we find that? Justifying yourself based on man-made rules or even justifying yourself based on God's law apart from our walk with the Lord. In our lives, as a church, as a, as a church in uh, 2022, as followers of Jesus under the New Covenant and the New Testament, we have to be careful that we don't develop certain things in our lives or that we're unwilling to evaluate certain things in our lives that could be causing us to be guilty of legalism. Sometimes legalism is found in the form of tradition. Tradition. Tradition's not bad. There's a lot of rich traditions of our faith that help us to, to worship Jesus. And when we experience those and we practice those, they, they help us to worship Jesus. But we ought to always be willing to ask questions about our traditions. And one of those questions should be, is this tradition, the way we do things, the way we do things because we've always done it that way, is it the most effective way to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? If it's not, we ought to be willing to lay it down for the sake of the gospel. We ought to be more strategic than just say, I hope people stumble into church, and when they get here, I hope they learn to like the way we do things quick enough that they're able to understand the gospel in a language that they don't even speak because we use special Christianese words. Hope they learn our language quick enough that they understand the gospel eventually and place their faith in Jesus in spite of what we're doing so that they can avoid uh, an eternity in hell. We ought to be willing to evaluate the way we do things. People are watching us. People are watching. People come to our church. People look at your life. And you know what people are really good at, uh, at um, determining in the year 2022? People are really good at, at, at determining whether or not you're fake. Isn't our fake meter? like pegged at this point in our lives because we get so many bogus phone calls from the IRS or, or whoever, you know, your extended warranty is out. Hey, I want to talk, you know, all these people that we're so good at, at 
determining who's real and who's fake. And I want to tell you, people are looking for something real. And I want you to know that they can tell if your faith is real as well. If it's just practice, if it's just religious practice, if it's just Christian tradition in your life and not genuine life transformation, I want you to understand people can tell. They can tell. We want to be genuine heartfelt followers of Jesus. The things we do ought to bring us closer to Christ. They ought to bring other people closer to Christ. And if they don't do that, then we got to ask, why are we doing these things? Why are we practicing these practices? So there's certain things that uh, I've been criticized for uh, by Pharisees, I mean by people. Um, historically, one of those uh, doesn't happen very often, but occasionally somebody will hit me about not using the King James Bible. Heard somebody say one time, if the King James Bible was good enough for Paul and Jesus, it's good enough for me too. Listen, I'm fine with the King James Bible. Probably a lot of you in this room are using the King James Bible right now. As a matter of fact, raise your hand if you use King James Bible. People who use King James Bible can't raise their hand in church. They're like, it's fine. It's fine. I'm okay. It's okay. I'm fine with that. If you grew up using the King James Bible, then you understand the language that's in it. The, the scriptures that your mother read to you were in King James Bible. The scriptures you memorized in Sunday school and Awanas were King James Bible. Then you should read the King James Bible. Praise God, and I'm happy for you to do it. But when we say like, well, it's the only accurate translation of the Bible. And if you don't use it, you're not really reading the Bible. Friends, that's, that's uh, pharisaical. It's also just stupid. I don't know a good word. I'm sorry. <laughs> Illogical. Is that better than stupid? You're not supposed to say stupid. It's one of those words on the list. <laughs> right? It's just, it's just not in keeping with uh, study of God's word throughout the ages. It's fine, it's an okay translation. It's not the only okay translation. There's other okay translations. That's one. How about this? How about dressing a certain way? Is that a Christian tradition? Absolutely. I mean, many of us grew up wearing our Sunday best, right, to church. And, and listen, I know for some people that that's still a special tradition for them, right? And, and they wake up on Sunday morning, they put on their best clothes because they've come, to, they're going to go to church and they're going to give God their best. And for them, that's part of it. And I'm, I'm totally happy with that. I'm totally fine with that. I think if that's in your heart, then you ought to wear suit and tie or tuxedo or whatever's good for you, okay? But when other people come into our church not dressed the way we want them to dress or we think the way we should dress and we look down on them for it, we're legalists. It might as well be fasting twice a week. It's the same. It's the same. Um, I, I wear a suit and tie typically for two occasions, funerals and weddings. And I don't do that many weddings. It's mostly funerals, Okay. The other day I was dressed, I had a suit and tie on for a funeral and somebody said, uh, jokingly, they said, hey, you shouldn't have got all dressed up on my behalf. And I said, you don't want me dressed up on your behalf. <laughs> but, but I don't mind wearing a suit and tie. It doesn't bother me. I mean, I kind of like it. As a matter of fact, I don't know if ladies, I don't know if you understand this, but men's dress clothes are really comfortable. Besides a tie. But the men's slacks are like pajamas. They're, they're silky. They're comfortable. It's not a big deal for me to wear. I don't mind wearing dress clothes. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't on Sunday mornings because here's what's true. Most people who don't go to church don't have dress clothes. Isn't that true? If you don't believe me, go to weddings and funerals, and you'll see people who are dressed nice with the sleeves halfway up their forearms. Or the, or the pant leg, because they don't fit anymore. They don't wear them enough. They don't buy them every year. People used to do that. They don't do that anymore. And so I want people to feel more comfortable. So you wear, come in, you wear your jeans, wear what you feel comfortable in when you come to church, and you'll fit in, and we won't look down on you because we're wearing the same stuff, right? So I've made a decision that I think that's the best way to reach lost people, 
And so I've adjusted a practice, a tradition that I had to fit that, right? Many of you have as well. Other things that we, we get kind of caught up on is sometimes the order of service. Well, we have to have the music, then we have preaching, then we have this. And, and all that stuff, is none of that's prescribed. You know, preaching is always prescribed and, and teaching God's word always prescribed in the New Testament. Singing, I think you see that throughout the scripture. So those things I think you make a great case for. But when you take up the offering, how you take up the offering, if you have a, a greeting time or not, all those things, man-made, man-made. I think tithing is obviously biblical and it's found throughout the scriptures. But when you tithe, how you tithe, um, those kind of things, the, the kind of bucket, do we have a plate, do we have a basket, do we have a hat? I've seen people pass a boot before, um, whatever, you know, whatever. That's all man-made, it's all man-made. And unfortunately, people use these things, practices, traditions, man-made laws, or even laws in the Old Testament or, or, or throughout the, the Bible to judge others or to justify themselves. And that's what's happening here. And Jesus speaks to these things with, with three little quick parables, three quick little parables. But I want to first say that, um, <clears throat> remember, the question's not about Jesus, it's about his disciples. And the earlier question was about Jesus, but they asked it to his disciples. And in both cases, it's Jesus that speaks up to respond. And I want to make a quick point of that and say uh, that, listen, um, if you're doing what God wants you to do in your life, let Jesus defend you. You don't, you don't have to argue with people. You're not going to stand before people and answer for the things you do and don't do. You're going to stand before Jesus and answer bef for the things that you do and don't do. And uh, let him defend you. Let him be the one that fights your battles. Okay, that was just a quick little side note. Let me get back to this <clears throat> first parable. The first one's about a wedding. And it says, the wedding guests, can the wedding guests be sad while the groom was with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. <clears throat> so Jesus tells them, look, it's the wrong time. It's the wrong time. Listen, if you went to a wedding and you showed up and you went to the service and there was a reception afterwards and you got to the reception and there was no food, you think, that's okay. They don't have to feed us. That's fine. But then you notice there's no cake. There's no cookies. There's no punch. There's nothing to eat, nothing to drink. That would be weird, right? And you might ask, where's the punch? Where's the cookies? Where's the cake? And imagine the bride or groom saying to you, oh, we're fasting at our wedding. You would immediately think, no, y'all are just cheap and you're trying to spiritualize it, <laughs> buy some cookies if you're going to have a reception, right? If not, elope, or so, I don't know. Right, that'd be weird, because a wedding is a time of celebration. At celebrations, you eat cookies, and you, you eat cake, and you drink punch. That's kind of what Jesus is saying. This is a, this is a time of celebration. There's going to become a time of mourning when the groom is taken away. Uh, and I'll, I'll help you read between the lines there. Jesus is the groom. And he is going to be taken away. Where was he going? He was headed to the cross, right? He said a time of mourning is coming. And that's when they'll fast. And that's when they'll mourn. It's coming. But right now is the wrong time. And imagine too, if, you, if, if fasting is helping you put away earthly things to focus on God, to get closer to God. It kind of seems silly to, to fast when God is at the table with you. That was the case here. They were literally face to face with Jesus. You can't get any closer than that, right? She says it's the wrong time. It's the wrong time. Ecclesiastes says that there's a time to weep, and there's a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. The groom will be taken away. And throughout the Old Testament, you see God referred to as the groom of Israel. Israel was the bride, his chosen special people, and God was the husband, and God was a good husband. Israel was a bad bride. In the book of Hosea, Hosea's whole life is an illustration of that one point, that God was a good husband to Israel. Israel was a bad bride to God. She cheated on him with all these other gods, committed idolatry, in every kind of form and fashion. In the New Testament, Jesus then is referred to as the groom of the church, right? Husbands, 
You're supposed to love your wife as Christ loved the church. I set you up for a little bonus point there. You're supposed to repeat that with me like you know it. Some of y'all missed it. It's all right. We'll try again next time. That's right. Jesus is the groom. In the book of Revelation, you see the wedding feast of the Lamb, where the church, his bride, is gathered to heaven to have a feast, a celebration. Good news, Baptists, there's no fasting in heaven. Isn't that great? I don't know if there's fried chicken, but there's going to be some good stuff. And so here's the point I'm trying to make here this morning, and I think Jesus is making, and I think the whole illustration of Jesus as the groom, I think, I think it all makes this one point. It's about a relationship with Jesus, not about rules. Obedience to God's commands comes after a relationship with Jesus. That's the most important thing. And in love, we respond to Christ with hopefully ongoing and greater obedience to him in our lives. That's the point. That's the goal. It's not about just checking off boxes. Like if you're married, you you know this, right? You can't just check off all the boxes and think that you and your spouse are on good terms. It's about a relationship. Isn't that true? I did um, some marital counseling a long time ago, so I can tell you about it now um, with a couple and I promise you, I'm not making this up. I kind of wish I was. I pro- you know, sometimes preacher stories are mm, borderline dishonest. But this one is totally true. Um, this woman's chief concern, her, her big issue with her husband, was that she thought he didn't love her. And so, here's how the conversation went with the man. He said, well, she thinks I don't love her. I get up. Every morning, five o'clock, go work my fingers to the bone so she can have nice things. She ought to know I love her. And here's how it went with the woman. I just wish he would tell me he loved me every once in a while. Right, that's a softball, gentlemen, right? That's an easy one. I said, are you kidding me? You just want him to say, you just want him to say it? The problem was he just wouldn't say he loved her on a regular basis. I look to him and say, listen, you bonehead, just say you love. That's why I don't do marital counseling anymore. <laughs> but right, it's, it's not enough to just check off the boxes. Just sh- I show up for work every morning. She ought to know it. No, that's not good enough. It's about a relationship. And so if you come to church and say, yeah, I'm right with God because I'm at church, check. I read my Bible every day this week, check. I got my tithe check ready, check. And all of those things you do are done out of external observance to rules. I would ask you this, but where's your heart at right now? How's your relationship with Jesus? Where are y'all at on this level today? Then judge yourself based on that. It's not about just rules, it's about a relationship. Then he gives two other illustrations. And uh, the first one is about uh, patching a, a, a pair of, of, of garments or something. If you use an unshrunken piece of fabric to patch uh, something that's, that's already shrunken, it's going to tear away and be ripped. And you know this, if you go buy a pair of jeans at the store and you try them on, they better not be too tight when you try them on because you know they're going to go through the washer and dryer a couple of times and they're not going to fit anymore if they're too tight, right? Because things shrink. Certainly the case here. Um, they didn't have poly cotton blends like we do today. They had wool and linen fabric. And so the idea was if uh, you take something that's unshrunk, has never been washed, and you sew it to a pair of pants or something that's uh, already been shrunk, it's going to shrink and tear away, and the patch will be ruined. We don't really patch clothes that much now. Nowadays, we buy clothes with holes in them, and we pay extra for that. It's wild. It's a new world. And so that's the first thing. It won't fit. It won't work. The second one is about wineskins. Most of y'all are really good Baptists, you don't understand this, but wine is a fermented alcoholic beverage. And when it ferments, it releases gas. So what they would do is they would put it in these animal skins, brand new animal skins, leather. They would clean them out, obviously, and then they would sew up the legs, usually keep the spout around where the neck was at open. They'd fill it with new wine, 
close it off. Well, as those gases would be released, the wineskins, the, the leather would expand, stretch out. And it worked out well. But if you took a one that's already stretched out and you put more new wine in it, it wouldn't stretch anymore. It already stretched as much as it's going to stretch and it would just bust open and it would spill out everywhere. And so here is, oh, by the way, I got to tell you this, my, my, my little girl who's five, the other day we were talking about something, I think it was on a, on a cartoon, they were talking about grapes in Italy. And I was like, she, she said something about, boy, they have a lot of grapes in Italy, some cartoon. And I said, what grapes in Italy? What are you talking about? And I, I missed the cartoon. Alyssa, my wife Alyssa was like, yeah, you know, like for wine. I said, oh yeah. And Eva goes, what, wine? My five-year-old got really fired up about wine. <laughs> but yeah. She goes, that still exists? I said, yeah, babe, what do, you, what do you mean? I thought it was just in the Bible, putting it together. So I said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's still, but she was really excited about wine. So we got to fix that at some point later. <laughs> you know, we got to talk about wine. We just moved on, you know, just hope she'll forget it. But the point is, these things inside of these things won't fit. If you apply this to this, it's not going to work. Jesus is saying, look, don't try to fit me, Jesus, into your messed up religion because it won't work. It won't work. It'll ruin it. They'll both be ruined. You can't put Jesus into your religion. You can't just add him in there. Some people try to do this, but it doesn't work. I saw one pastor one time illustrating this point. You just can't add him in. And he was making the point specifically that you can't just add Jesus into your life either. Some people think they can do that, right? They treat going to church or getting Christ in their life like going to the gym. It's like a good idea, a healthy habit, you know? Like I'll add a little, little exercise to my life and my life will be better. But you can't do that with Jesus because he'll run it. He said this, he took two different beverages. One was coffee and one was orange juice. He said, this coffee represents your old life before Christ. And it's enjoyable and you like your life. And the orange juice represents a new life with Christ. And you like orange juice and it's a great life and it's enjoyable. But when you try to mix the two, he poured the coffee, I mean the orange juice in the coffee and he took a drink of it on stage. I thought about recreating that. I just didn't want to do it, you know. Like, Ugh. He just ruins both of them. And that's the point here. I think when you try to add Jesus to your life, it's going to mess up your old life and you won't be experiencing the new life in Christ. Jesus doesn't want part of your life. He wants all of it. He doesn't want to be something you add in. He wants to take over. Nobody gets part of Jesus. You either get all of him or you get none of him. He either gets all of you or you get none of him. It's like the house built on the rock. We've already seen earlier in the book of Matthew. The house built on the sand was destroyed. The house built on the rock survived. You don't need to fix up the outside of the house. You need to tear the old house down and build a new house. The Bible says you need to die to self. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again, whole new, brand new. And it's not like Jesus was saying, look, your system's good, Pharisees, but I'm just going to fix it up a little bit. I'm just going to make it a little bit better by dying on the cross. It's not like, hey, um, Pharisee called Judas, Judaism, now 20% more free, you know, like they do Cheetos. It's not that. It's saying wipe the slate clean and start over. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. Jesus didn't die, friends, listen, he didn't die to make you better. He didn't die to make your life better. He died to make you brand new. And that's what he offers today. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. That's what Jesus wants to do in your life. Friends, the gospel is that no matter how good you tried to be like the Pharisees, no matter how many rules you tried to follow, you and I have fallen short wholesale without exception. We all have missed the mark. That's it. 
If we could be justified by following rules, God would have let us do it that way. But knowing that we could never be justified that way, God was willing to send his son Jesus to the cross to pay not for his sins, but to pay for your sins and my sins. And that by putting our faith in him, he could make us holy and right with God totally and completely in a way that following rules could never, ever do. That's the gospel. That's that's the number one thing. And after that, when we get that squared away, we get that relationship with Jesus right, then we begin to try to conform our life to the model that he gave us in his life and he's given us throughout his word. That's when we see obedience, holiness come into play here. <clears throat> not to justify ourselves, not to make ourselves right, but to, to, as, a, as an offering to Jesus to live according to his word and his standard. Friend, I wonder if you're here today because you've come as a follower of Jesus, being purchased by his blood, having been saved, and and you want to be here to worship Jesus because he is worthy of it, and because by doing that, you grow closer to him in your relationship with him. I know there's some people in this room that that's why you're here today. I wonder if there's anybody else here that's here today because you're just trying to get enough uh, on your church attendance to keep you out of hell one day. To check off enough boxes that maybe eventually God will accept you the way you are apart from being born again. And here's what I want you to know. You'll never be good enough. You're worse than you think you are. But Jesus is better than you could ever imagine. And, And he died on a cross to pay for all those things you did wrong. And what you need to do right now is abandon all those other ways you have in your mind of getting to God, forsake every one of them, fall on your face and surrender yourself to Jesus. Let him take away your sins. And you could begin today, before you leave here, you could begin a new life. You could be born again. You could be brand new. Would you do that today? I want you to have a moment to think about that. I want you to have a moment to pray about that. So would you bow your head and close your eyes around the room? If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and forgive your sins, I want to ask you this question. What are you relying on to get into heaven one day? When you stand before God and he asks you, if he asks you, why should I let you into heaven and not send you to hell forever and ever? What are you going to say? Well, I tried to be a good person. It won't work. Well, I went to church. It won't work. I followed the rules. It won't work. The only answer is On this day, at this moment in my life, I ask Jesus to come in and do for me what I could never do for myself. I know he died on a cross. He did that for me to pay for the things I did wrong. And there was a moment in my life when I asked him to come into my heart and forgive me for all those things. And I turned over my life to him. And I was made brand new. Have you had a moment like that in your life? Has there been a moment in your life when you asked him to come into your heart, forgive your sins, and you turned over control of your life to him? Listen, apart from that, you are lost. You're lost. You're going to spend forever and ever apart from God in a place called hell and God doesn't want it that way and I don't want it that way for you and First Baptist Church doesn't want it that way for you. We exist to tell you about a better way, the only way. If you're relying on anything else, please, friend, today, would you 
put your faith in Jesus once and for all. We call that getting saved. Would you be saved today? Here's what it takes. It takes sincerity in your heart, calling out to God in heaven, asking him to come in and forgive you once and for all, and giving your life to him. I want to give you a little bit of time to pray this morning. Call out to God in heaven. Ask him to come in. Here in just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. It's where we invite you to respond to what God maybe have, has done in your heart and your life. If you're here today and you've asked Jesus into your heart, I want to invite you in just a moment when we stand, would you come and talk to myself or one of the only other guys down here? We want to talk to you about baptism, that next step of following Jesus. We want to talk to you about uh, church membership and, and the next step in your life. And we want to celebrate with you. If you're here today and you've been saved, you've not followed through with baptism, maybe you need to come make that uh, official this morning and, and get that scheduled. We'll get that scheduled and you won't have to think about that again. You'll have that area covered. We'll get it taken care of. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe you have been at First Baptist and I've talked to a few people recently. I know I need to join the church. I need, I need to get it taken care of. Um, <clears throat> listen, maybe today's the day when you you just need to follow through and, and make that official. Love to chat with you about that this morning. As we stand, go ahead and stand this morning. If you need to come, you come. And I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and faults. Oh, you see them all, still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the
Amen. Be seated for just a moment. Would you be seated for just a second? Hey, I want to thank you so much for being here at church today. We're really glad that you are here and you come to worship. Uh, we have one decision to announce this morning. Uh, this is Brittany. Brittany Wright, would you come? Brittany comes this morning having prayed and asked Jesus Christ to be her Lord and Savior and wanted to follow through with baptism. So that's pretty awesome. Praise God for that. Be sure and, and welcome Brittany uh, to our church and congratulate her on that important decision that she has made this morning. Isn't that a big deal? That's a big deal. Praise the Lord. Hey, I'm going to uh, pray for us and we'll be dismissed today. And uh, hope to see you Wednesday night for all of our Wednesday night activities. All those are on. A meal over here at 530. We've got Bible studies for all ages. Um, we've got kids. We've got youth. We've got adults. Nursery for parents who are in Bible study and things like that. So come Wednesday. Love to see you. And then we'll see you back next Sunday. Let's pray. God, we love you. We're so glad we get to be in your house. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together. We thank you, Father, for the decision that was made today to follow you. Thank you, God, that your Holy Spirit moves on our heart through, the, through your word and does what only you could do and draws people to the cross. We, so, we are so grateful, Father. Thank you. And God, we pray for all those that are here today. I thank you for each and every one of them. And God, I pray that you would bless them and bless their homes and that you would bring them back to here, us here at First Baptist Church very soon. It's your name I pray. Amen.